Indeed, Jesus, you are wonderful and you are risen. And I pray that this morning, um, whether we're in this room right now or wherever anyone is listening, that we will experience you as a living Lord, as a Lord with his arms open wide. And Lord, cause us to uh, run to your arms, to accept your call, to experience the joy that you hold out for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can pray this prayer in some confidence because you are risen, you are alive. Amen. So thank you, Linda, for coming and and leading us. That's good. Uh, Once again, uh, even when I was putting the words to the songs uh, into the presentation, you know, I, I didn't see until we were singing them how much they match some of the things we're going to look at today. So it's just amazing how often that works out. Anyway, once again, welcome you who have come here live and then those of you who are joining us at home. Thanks for plugging in. Hopefully it won't be too long. You can enjoy the warming weather. It might be a good day to get out and take a walk. You're going to get very wet, but at least you'll be warmer than you've been uh, the last uh, month or two. Uh, So we're thinking about this idea of count the cost, and uh, that's kind of what I entitled this sermon, and uh, it's actually that idea of counting the cost, at least in churches that I grew up in. Uh, We're often encouraged to consider that phrase, to count the cost, Uh, and where it kind of comes from is the idea of the cost of discipleship, and that phrase is kind of uh, often used among Christians, especially because of this book by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and if you If you don't know his story, it's a story you really ought to be familiar with. He was a a, a Lutheran pastor in Germany in the 1930s and up into the, um, well, until 1945. Uh, And he was one of the guys who, who resisted Hitler. Not every Christian in Germany at the time resisted Hitler, but, but he did you know, so much so that that he was thrown in prison and and literally weeks before Hitler himself committed suicide, he had Dietrich Bonhoeffer hanged. You know, he so much despised Bonhoeffer because Bonhoeffer wanted to be faithful to the truth and he was part of the confessing church of of those, you know, who who were faithful to Jesus Christ, not to the powers, that be. But one of the important books that Bonhoeffer wrote was The Cost of Discipleship. It's worthwhile reading. It's mainly based on the Sermon on the Mount, and it's very challenging. I mean, it's very challenging. It, it, it's hard to read. But one of the famous quotes that he gave is this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That in following Jesus, there is a sacrifice, and, and this really just comes from uh, what Jesus said. To follow him, you have to pick up your cross, something that you die on, and um, follow along with him. In Luke chapter 9, I I referenced earlier this kind of conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, asking, who do the crowd say that I am, and then who do you think that I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah of God. You're the one that the Father sent as the Savior. Then it says, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. But he said, the Son of Man, it's a reference to himself, must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed on the third day raised to life. Then he says to them all, if anyone would come after me, he has to deny himself and take up his cross daily, in a sense, die daily to, to whatever kind of life that he was hoping to have, you've got to kill that to follow Jesus. <clears throat> he has to take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, his present physical life, if that's your priority, you're going to end up losing it. Whatever loses his life for me will actually save his or her real life. Self, So that's kind of where that idea of the cost of discipleship comes from. And then at the end of Luke chapter 9, uh, Jesus has some conversation with three different people that all kind of um, revolve around this word this of follow me. And it's kind of the most common uh, evangelistic uh, 
plea that Jesus gave to people is simply follow me. Come along with me. If you want this kind of life, you even want to know what it's about, all you can do is follow me, and you're only going to figure it out by following me. So come along with me. Last week, we looked at that journey to Jerusalem, and it says what we looked at last week in the end of Luke chapter 9. It's a time approach for him to be taken up to heaven. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And like I said last week, that his entire life was focused on the cross, and he was living in the shadow of the cross, and everything that he did was in light of that cross, the end of the story, why he came to die on the cross to save us for our sins. So as you're walking along on this journey to the cross, in that context, a man comes up to him and he says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Because, I mean, you know, he'd been doing some wonderful things and people thought of him as being pretty wonderful, very welcoming, and he's doing miracles and so forth. And so people had this sense, there's something about Jesus. I want to participate in this life that Jesus is talking about. So I'll follow you, Lord. And of course, for any kind of, you know, preacher, that's really good news. That's kind of what you want. You know, I mean, especially evangelist, you know, you want people to, to, you know, to come forward in a service and, you know, be all excited. And, you know, most evangelists or preachers, yeah, come, come, come. You know, it's easy. Just come along. And Jesus gives a very different message. Instead of saying, yes, come. I mean, we just sang about he opens his arms open wide. and, And in a sense, he does. In another sense, Jesus takes a different approach here. So the guy says, I'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replies, foxes have holes to sleep in. Birds have air or nests to sleep in. But I don't. I don't have a place to lie my head. If you're going to follow me, that's great. You can follow me. Jesus is not telling the guy no. But he's trying to point out to the guy what it's going to mean. If you're going to follow me, you're not necessarily going to have a comfortable life. You're not going to have a conventional life. You know, with you know, the American dream of your white house and a white picket fence and 2.3 children and so forth and a pet dog and all of that and your kids going to a nice school, that conventional life and you know, a nice car, two cars in the driveway, you know, hopefully... If you're going to follow Jesus, that might not be possible for you. Then it says, Jesus says to another man. So the first guy took the initiative with Jesus and said, I'll follow you. The next guy, Jesus takes initiative and says, follow me. But the man says, wait, let me first go and bury my father. Now, it's hard to know exactly what's going on here. might be what the guy is saying, well, my father is still alive. He's a little bit old. I've got to take care of my father while he's alive because you are supposed to, you know, take care of your parents. When my father is dead, then I'll follow you. It might be what he's saying. Or it might be what's going on here is his father's already died. And generally back then, you know, you would bury the body fairly quickly. Um, And then it would be in the tomb for a while, maybe as long as a year or longer till basically the flesh rotted away. And then sometime later, you would bury the bones in a more permanent location. So it might be that's what the guy is saying is, okay, I I have to first fulfill my obligations to my dead father. Because again, this is what society expects of us. So let me do that. And when I've done that, then I'll come follow you. And that, I mean, you know, that, that makes sense. You've got to respect your parents. You've got to do those conventions and so forth. But Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. If you're going to follow me, then, then follow me. Once again, it's kind of, you know, hard to know exactly what Jesus is trying to say here. But it might be, let the people who are spiritually dead bury the physical dead. Okay, but if you're going to follow me, you know, you're going to have to keep focus. You, you can't do all the things that are necessarily expected of you anymore because there's a higher priority. So another says, Lord, I'll follow you. But first, I need to go back and say goodbye to my family. Again, that makes sense. But Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. 
Which again, if you picture, you know, someone plowing his field, maybe he has an oxen or something pulling the plow, and, you know, if he's going this way and he's looking behind him, you know, you know what's going to happen. It's not going to make a straight row where he's plowing. You know, he's going to be all over the place. So Jesus said, look, if you're, if you're going to pursue the kingdom of God, then you can't look back. Now, one of the things that's important to keep in mind with, with, with these stories, and I'm going to say it again, and the next thing we're going to look at is that <clears throat> Jesus is not giving absolute laws. Okay, that, that, that's not his point here, that, that now you can never say goodbye to your parents. Okay, I, I encourage you to say goodbye to your parents. You know, if you go home and you visit home and you come back to Latvia, probably you should say goodbye. There's nothing necessarily wrong with saying goodbye. That's not Jesus' point. <clears throat> He's trying to remind people that there is a sacrifice and there's a required focus. And the whole idea of focus is if you're focused on one thing, you can't be focused on a lot of other things, and it's not focus. Okay? If you're looking at a lot of different things, it's by definition not focused. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be focused. And also Jesus is saying there's a kind of urgency to life now, there's an urgency, a little more intensity, not going back and forth. There's a direction. I mean, Jesus is focused on going to Jerusalem, and everything that he's doing is in light of that. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you've got to live with that similar kind of urgency. <clears throat> I remember um, years ago when I was in university, but it's still a very vivid memory, when I, I, I played football in, in, in university, and I wasn't like any kind of a great player, but I did play. Um, and I remember our assistant coach, his name was Steve. Um, and um, I, I can still hear his voice across the field, and he would yell out, urgent, urgent. And what he was doing is when the other team had the ball and they were attacking and they were pressing toward our goal... He was trying to heighten our awareness and saying, urgent, we can't just, you know, kind of uh, play around. You know, we've got to get focused. We've got to get that ball away from our end of the field. We've got to be urgent about it because if they're going to keep pushing on us, it's more and more dangerous. Don't play game. I mean, of course, football is a game, so in a sense you're playing a game, but you know what I mean. Don't, don't just play around you know, like you're kicking a ball with, with friends in a the street. There's urgency. And I can hear his voice across the field, urgent, urgent. And when we'd hear that, it really did heighten our senses. And it causes us to focus. And we're more, you know, getting our entire body in the right stance to block our goal and to get the ball and to get it downfield so that the other team didn't score. And so Jesus is saying there's... There's a required kind of urgency to life if you're going to follow him. So, so this is kind of what the cost of discipleship is, the cost of following Jesus. But that's not actually exactly the main thing I want to communicate today. It costs to follow Jesus, but it costs more not to. And that's mainly what I want to communicate today is what it will cost us to not follow Jesus. There is a cost to following Jesus, but there's a greater cost to not follow Jesus. Now, whoever created this image, I'm not sure exactly what cost they had in mind. You know, they might have had in mind, you know, the cost to follow Jesus, but if you don't follow Jesus, you're going to die and go to hell. So that's why it's better to follow Jesus. That's not the point I'm making this morning. Okay, that's not the, the cost of not following Jesus I want to point to this morning. Uh, but there's another kind of cost to not following Jesus that if we understood this, then we would be willing to pay what it does cost to follow Jesus. So this is what happens in the next scene in Luke chapter 10. And this is a, an important scene here in the Gospel of Luke. It's not a story that's told in the other Gospels, and that's going to be very significant. All the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
have the story of Jesus sending out the 12 as kind of missionaries, and he sends out the 12 on a little mission, and they're going to go to different villages and prepare the way uh, for when Jesus comes. But Luke alone tells this story of Jesus sending a larger group of people. Uh, Some manuscripts have 70 people. In a moment, I'll maybe explain why it's more than likely what Luke wrote was 72 other disciples, not just the 12, but 72 other disciples. Jesus sends out two by two to also go to villages. So he sends them ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he tells them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I mean, that's one of the specific things we can pray for. I mean, something specific that Jesus says we ought to pray for. We ought to pray that other workers will be sent to the field. You know, I mean, for those of you who are, you know, sitting here, you can see that map. I mean, right now you could look at that world map and pray that the Lord would send workers to that field. I mean, there's some places with lots of workers, but some of those countries have very few workers, and people don't hear the message. I mean, some of you maybe come from places where it's hard to hear the message. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers even to your home. So Jesus says, Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Once again, Counted the cost. Don't take a purse or bag or sandals and don't greet anyone on the road. Once again, we shouldn't think of this as some kind of absolute law that Jesus is saying. Don't say hello to anyone. He's not, that's not exactly what he's saying. You know, I mean, um, here in Latvia and maybe in all of Northern Europe, you know, people are not like in some other places where it's perfect strangers say hello and smile. You know, on my street where I live, when I'm walking down the street, maybe to go to the train, you know, sometimes when I walk past neighbors, normally, you know, you can't even, you know, make eye contact. But more and more, I always try, even my introverted self, to make eye contact and to smile and to say hello, you know. And more and more in our neighborhood, people will do that. You know, you can at least kind of, you know, eh, you know give a little eye that you acknowledge Jesus isn't saying don't do that. He's not saying it's wrong to say hello to people. He's simply saying again, got to remain focused. Don't get distracted by long conversations necessarily when there's this time of urgency. So once again, we have these words, focus and urgency. And that's how we need to understand what Jesus is telling these 72. Don't take purse or bag or sandals. Don't take a lot of extra stuff. You know, once again, I mean, maybe you've been on airplanes and maybe this is where my sinful nature comes out. Um, and I haven't even been on an airplane for a year. But one of the things that irritates me in, in traveling is people who have lots of carry-on bags you know, and, and it's like, why don't you just check your bag in? And they have a couple bags, and they have these big bags, and there's always a couple people that I see them coming up the aisle, and I'm thinking, you cannot get that in the overhead bin. What were you thinking when you packed? It's not going to work. And some people are trying to jam it in there, and I feel so sorry for the cabin staff who are trying to be nice, and I'm sure they're wanting to call names of those people, but they're, they're just, they, they try to push it in themselves, and then they say, oh, I don't think it'll get in. We'll put it up here. But it's, people have all these bags, and all these people are in the aisle waiting behind them. And, and Jesus is simply saying, don't bring a lot of stuff that slow you and everyone down. Okay? There's an urgency to what's going on here. So Jesus gives these instructions to these 72. He says, when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there The kingdom, and say, the kingdom of God is near you. 
If they don't accept your message, then when you leave the town, shake your foot off, the dust off your foot, as if to say, you know, I'm not having anything more to do with you. So they're sent with a sense of focus and urgency, you know, to the, these towns that Jesus is going to. Now, Luke doesn't describe what they actually do. He just has Jesus' words to them about their mission and how to conduct their mission. He doesn't even have a picture of them going off. So it just, Jesus talks to them and he says, he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects him who sent me. That's verse 16. And then the next verse is, the 72 returned. So we don't know what it looked like when they were on this mission. Luke doesn't give any kind of description of, of what they did. Why am I even talking about this story? There's a significance to this story to us. Uh, and why there's these 72 and why Luke tells this story in this gospel that the other gospels don't tell us about. Who are these 72 and what, why, what do they have to do with us? Now, we're in the Gospel of Luke. The man who wrote the Gospel of Luke, who we call Luke, also wrote another book in the Bible. That's the book of Acts. Probably next autumn we're going to start a series in the book of Acts. And Luke and Acts go together. And if you've read the book of Acts, you know that it's the story of what happens after the crucifixion and resurrection Jesus ascends to heaven, and then what? And the book of Acts talks about the church, the Holy Spirit coming, the church being founded, and then the gospel spreading. Not through Jesus directly, but through followers of Jesus. And one of the things Luke is doing here is he's preparing these people for the mission that they're going to have the mission that the church is going to have after Jesus ascends to heaven. That's us. This is a story about us. The reason that the number 72 is significant is that at the time, at that time, it was kind of understood, at least in the Jewish community, there were 72 nations, 72 different nations in the world. That obviously wasn't an exact scientific figure. That was just what was understood at the time. 72 nations. So almost certainly this number 72 was chosen on purpose as a way of reminding people this is about the nations. That's why this series is called The Gospel for the World. It's not just for the Jewish people, even though the story focuses in Israel at that time. It's a story about the nations it's a story about God's love for all the nations. The story about God choosing a people who will take that message of the kingdom of God to the ends of the world. It's about us. Okay, this is a story for us. It's not just about them 2,000 years ago. It's a story for us. In Luke's mind, he wants us to read ourselves into this story. And as we see these 72 returning, this is when we begin to find out the cost of non-discipleship. What it would have cost these 72 if they had decided not to follow Jesus. When Jesus said, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves, if they had been thinking, well, wait a second, I don't, I'm not sure that's what I want. I'm glad to be with Jesus, see the exciting things, and when Jesus is there doing miracles, you know, or reproducing food, I'm glad to be a part of that. I'm not sure I want to be a part of going to towns that might not like me. So they might have chosen not to do this, especially when Jesus talked about the focus and the urgency that was required. They might have thought, that's not quite for me, at least not yet. I want to have my nice conventional life first. Then maybe I'll do a little bit for Jesus, maybe on Sundays or whatever. <clears throat> but if they had made that choice, they would have missed out and they would have paid a price 
And the cost of not following Jesus would actually have been greater than the cost of following Jesus. So it says, the 72 returned with joy. They said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Look at what we were able to be a part of. What they had seen Jesus do, they're able to say, we, we got to do that same thing. My father didn't, never did that. My grandfather never did that. My great-grandfather never did that. And I, I got to be a part of this. I got to do some of the things that Jesus was doing. And Jesus replies, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions who overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but mainly rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So they return with joy and they're excited. And they recognize that they've had a chance to do something, to participate in something that has cosmic significance that goes beyond going to university and getting married and having a job, that goes beyond what most people live their lives for. They recognize that they have had a chance They were given the gift of doing something meaningful with their life. And Jesus agrees with them. And he says, in what you were doing, I saw Satan fall. I saw the defeat of Satan in your activity. The great enemy of God was being defeated in what these 72 disciples were doing. Just a few months before, they could never have imagined this experience. But this is what they got to do. So the 72 returned with joy. They would have missed that joy if they hadn't followed Jesus. They would have lost that joy. That's the cost of non-discipleship is to miss the joy, to lose the joy of being with Jesus and participating in what Jesus is doing. They would have lost meaning and significance in life. So the disciples return with joy and that's the first thing Luke tells us about them as they return, they They've come back with joy. At that time, Luke says, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've hidden these things to the wise and learned people, the experts in the law, the religious leaders in Jerusalem, They've, they've closed their eyes, they've closed their minds to this message, and now it's hidden from them. The people who ought to have known, the people with the high status in society. Jesus says, you've hidden it from them, but you've revealed it to little children. These 72, these whatever, 20 people. It's revealed you. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Then he turns to the disciples and said, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings, many prophets and kings, the religious elite and political elite, 
the religious elite and political elite. Many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but they didn't. They wanted to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. But you got to see it and hear it. At that time, Jesus, full of joy, Jesus, full of joy, not just these disciples who got to participate, but Jesus himself, Jesus himself sees them and he is full of joy because of them. Jesus experiences joy because of his disciples. How amazing is that? How amazing must it have been for these 72 to see the joy on Jesus' face, to see it in his eyes and to think, this is unbelievable. We were able to give Jesus joy, not just our joy, but the happiness of Jesus. And we got to be a part of that. I mentioned, um, you know, back when I was in university and I played football, and like I said, I was not not a great player. I was okay, you know, but not great. Um, But I I did play, so I'm glad about that. Uh, But, um, you know, especially in, in university, I... Um, I didn't have a lot of great games, you know. I would go in mainly a substitute, try to do okay for 10, 15 minutes and usually be taken out. But there was, there was one game that I really did a good job in. And even during the game, I thought, man, I'm really, I'm doing better than usual. You know, so I, I was aware of this was like maybe my best game, maybe not from high school years, but at least from university years. <clears throat> but I remember... Uh, toward the end of the game, and the coach took me out of the game. And so I was, you know, running to the sideline to go out of the game. And I can still picture the coach's face, you know, because I had had a good game. And, and he knew that. And I could see on his face his pleasure in what I had contributed to that game. And how he greeted me because I had contributed. I can still remember that, you know, those, I don't remember much, you know, of those years playing football, but I remember the assistant coach yelling, urgent. And I remember the look of joy on the coach's face because I had participated. Jesus full of joy. Joy because of what his disciples had done. And if they had not followed Jesus, they would have missed that. I imagine at that moment, they would not have traded anything, anything in the world for that look of joy that they could see on Jesus' face. There was nothing at that moment in time, I imagine that would have been more precious to them than seeing joy on Jesus' face. Now, you might think that's unimaginable for you, but it's not any more unimaginable for you than it was for them. These 72, there was, they were just peasant people. Most of them were probably illiterate Most of them didn't have much extra money. They probably did have to sacrifice for this, however long this mission was. You know, they were were stretched way out of their comfort zone. But there was nothing special about them. Jesus did not choose the elite. These 72 would have been completely unforgettable apart from this. It is as imaginable for you as it was for them, for you to experience joy and for you to give joy to Jesus. 
You are candidates for this joy. You can have it. Just what Jesus said, just follow me. It's an invitation to anyone and everyone. Just follow me. Whatever significance you thought you wanted to have, I can give you greater significance. Eternal cosmic significance. Just follow me. Um, What's our time? I'm almost done here. There's a a book by a man named Malcolm Muggeridge. He was, uh, um, I think in the, whatever, 40s, 50s. He was a journalist. Uh, He interviewed a lot of famous people, I think, during World War II. He also operated kind of in intelligence services and so forth. Um, But he was fairly well known, you know, especially for, for interviewing very important people. So he had met all sorts of very, very important people, at least in the United Kingdom. But then he met Jesus, and it transformed his life. And his kind of autobiography is called Chronicles of Wasted Time. It's an amazing book. And he just kind of tells the story of all these things that he did and all the important people that he met. And his conclusion was that it was all a waste of time. What a waste. It was completely and utterly empty. All that life before Jesus. And and he he talks about some of those important people that he met that everyone thought were important, were significant, and important things. And he concludes they all have such empty lives. He even quotes one British politician, you know, who was in government all his life. And when he came to the end of his career and retired, he realized nothing that he ever tried to do ever went to anything. I mean, he was in government all his life, and when he looked back at what good he actually did, he concluded it was nothing, zero, zilch. It was a wasted life as a political leader. Chronicles of Wasted Time. Jesus can save us from that. He calls us to follow him. And yeah, there's a cost There's a bit of a price to pay. There are something to give up. There is a cross to carry. There are some desires and wishes we might have to kill in our life. But the return is so much greater, so much more. The cost of non-discipleship is so much higher than the cost of discipleship. So if we don't follow Jesus, we're actually going to miss out. And those who count the cost and follow Jesus as they look back at their life, it doesn't seem like a cost anymore. They return with joy. They live their life with joy. And when they meet Jesus and see the joy on his face, what could be greater than that? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for calling. Thank you for opening your arms, for calling us to yourself, for allowing us to follow you. Thank you for saving us from a life of insignificance, from a life of wasted time, from a life without focus, from a life without purpose, from a life without joy. Help us, Lord, to consider carefully the costs and what we want in our life and what we want our life to mean. Once again, may we hear your voice, follow me, and may we do that. And give us the joy that you've created us for, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.